So I'm Tom Craig. I'm a longtime member of the uh, Technology and Engineering Department here at Rocky Mountain Public Media. And today we're going to take a little memory tour, a walk down memory lane at the 1089 Bannock location where Rocky Mountain PBS has been uh, located for about 20 years just prior to its move to the Buell Media Center. With me today are my friends Laura and Buzz Sampson, longtime volunteers and supporters of Rocky Mountain PBS, and they're going to keep me on track and make sure that my memories uh, hold true. So it's interesting today, the reason I'm holding this tablet is Laura and Buzz Sampson are joining me virtually as we are all under the uh, COVID-19 pandemic here in 2020. Rocky Mountain PBS moved to Bannock in 1992. As I recall, it was October of that year. There is a sign on the building that is now in its third iteration. It originally said Channel 6 Incorporated. It was later changed to Rocky Mountain PBS. And then in the, I think in the teens of the 2000s, our, our formal name changed to Rocky Mountain Public Media as we merged with KUVO-FM and that sign, the company logos, changed to reflect that uh, new partnership. Out in front of the building along the front in the sidewalk, a lot of handprints from stars of the late 50s and uh, early 60s on ABC at that time. When we moved here, we added two handprints, one of General Manager Don Johnson and later of General Manager James Morgese. They also signed and put their handprints in here and is now part of the um, the sidewalk tour of Prince. Okay, we're gonna go inside now. So one of the more interesting things for me over the years has been the fact that for some reason I made it onto this mural that depicts Many of the uh, staff and many of the talent that um, have run through this organization over the years. Was that this mural on both, on both walls was actually donated to the station by Station's Archive Memories. And it took us several years to put this together. We started the organization in 2000 and we collected photographs and we organized all those photos, and uh, Dr. Oberholzer is in the upper left of that wall that comes in, and he was really the founder of making public television available in the Denver area. Now, as I recall, Studio One was largely kept the same from when KUSA owned this facility. So being as that this was the largest open footprint in the building. You can imagine that in addition to doing television productions out of here, it also was an event space. And then in the, the early 2000s, we had a producer's reunion, yes. which I, it went back to the 50s, and anybody that we could get a hold of was invited. And it was wonderful. All these, all these people who had produced shows for the station, over all the years the station had been there, got to come and exchange stories. Very, very fun. It was nice to have a, a secondary studio for general production purposes so that we could leave some of the uh, larger sets up in, in Studio One in place with lighting um, and to be able to bring the little one-offs in here as necessary. But we also did some regular productions out of here as well. Tom, I think we even shot some Super 6 School News in that room too. Oh, we absolutely did, yes. So some wonderful memories of, of young children learning about broadcasting and what fun it was, but also how scary it was for them. But mostly, it was fun. This building was once a Packard car dealership. And the car dealership had a safe in this building which they would put their cash and other items in. And it is over here. So we see, if I close the door, an old J-bomb safe and lock company door to this safe. It's built into the block. 
I'm sure there are rods that go from inside the frame deep into the block, both um, left, right, and up into it. A gentleman named Bill Hicks, who was an engineer here for many, many years, maybe as long as 40, once told me he knew the combination to the safe and he gave it to me. Bill has since passed away and I have been too scared to lock the safe and try it in case it didn't open. We're gonna pass through a conference room that we dubbed the Skylight Lounge because it had skylights in it. And depending on the time of day, you either had hot sunlight beating down on you or it got cloudy and you wanted to fall asleep. And by the way, this fireplace here when we moved in, the, which we've never had turned on, as far as I know, the whole time we've moved here, it's a gas fireplace. The mirror here, um, you didn't immediately know that you could open this up and there was a, a little storage area behind it, but we did so shortly after moving in and found booze from the general manager at uh, KOSA at the time. And we're oh, told- that's funny. Mike Halpin has some real good stories about that. <laughs> yes. On a door that's now labeled production tape library, this once entered into the garage. Oh, no. We'll take another we'll take another entry in here. So as we head into the space that was once a three bay garage that helped to house the many, many thousands of tapes that were generated by the production and the content team. We inventoried those tapes and it took us years. There were over 15,000. Yeah, almost 16,000 tapes in that room. When I think about leaving the building, it's, while it's an inanimate object and it, you, you don't have the same emotional attachment to it as you would the colleagues, that you worked with. I think that it's kind of like moving on from high school to college and that you, you have these great friends, this building, right, that you went to high school with. But when you move on to college, you kind of, it's, it's as if you could never go home again, right? And so I, while I look back with fondness on this building and, and certainly the people that I worked with in this building, um, it's, it's time to move on.